My name is Matthew Wayne Selznick, and this is Sonatotem, episode 86. Hello, my friends. On this and every episode of Sonatotem, we talk about making stuff, mostly writing, finding success as we each define it for ourselves, and staying healthy and sane in the process. Who am I to be talking to you about such things? Well, I have been a DIY independent creator, self-publisher, and podcaster since... My goodness, 15 years and more. And in my day job, I help other authors, podcasters, and other creators bring their creative endeavors to fruition, to market, and to an audience. Every other episode, it's me talking to you about my experiences building a creative writing life, the triumphs and tragedies and victories and defeats and discoveries and questions and everything that I encounter that I might pass on to you as a teaching moment. Believe me, there are plenty. That's every other episode. Every other episode, I sit down with another author, writer, or creator of some kind, usually a writer and an author. And that's what we're doing today. Today, I am in conversation with Krista Walsh. Now, like many authors, Krista has been writing since she was old enough to hold a pen, she says. After her first publication in April of 2012, She made her way through various collaborations and anthologies until she founded the self-publishing brand of Raven's Quill Press, which you can find at theravensquill.com. On her blog, she hosted the Greylands Serial, a project with five other authors that became her self-publishing debut in November 2013. Since then, she has released numerous epic and urban fantasy titles, and there's many more on the way. In her downtime, she can be found wandering Ottawa, Ontario, looking for inspiration, buried in a book, wrangling her toddler, and keeping up with her Australian cattle dog. You can find Krista Walsh online at KristaWalshAuthor.com. And that's Krista with a K, K R I S T A W A L S H Author.com. In the conversation to come, we cover a lot of ground, including writing tools and productivity tools, time management, finding a way to juggle a writing life with a day job and having a small, small child, as well as the benefits of community and collaboration. And we got also into how Krista approaches her own work from novels through trilogies through epics. As with every conversation I've had the pleasure of having so far on Sonatotem, I think there's going to be a lot you're going to get out of it. So uh, let's get to it. Here is my conversation with Krista Walsh. <laughs> I always like to begin by asking, what do you create? Urban and epic fantasy is kind of my my big focus. It started far more on the epic fantasy, but sort of evolved with actually kind of more of my reading habits. And now I kind of straddle both. And then lately, I've kind of been moving a little bit more towards like urban fantasy romance. So I'm, I'm kind of having fun exploring that side a little bit. But that's kind of been my focus for the past gosh, 10 years. (laughs) Mostly novels, short stories, all different? uh... Mostly novels. I have set out more than once to write a novella. Um, I think I've I've succeeded once. Everything else has grown (laughs) 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 into much longer novels. I'm not good at small form, and I admire the people who are. (laughs) So we have an idea of, of, of what you make, what you write. My question is, why? Why do you create? Oh, gosh. I actually have 
photographic evidence of me as a toddler, just like scribbling all over pages. I, I have, unfortunately, written evidence of my mm -hmm. work at six years old, uh, writing short stories. So I, I've been doing this basically as soon as I learned how to write. And I, I feel like, I feel like more than anything, it is just, it is a drive. I, I often especially in, when I'm in the middle of an idea, I relate it more to an addiction because if I, if I go too many days without getting words down on the page, I get really, really antsy and cranky. And my husband understands it's better for my mental health to give me some writing time. Uh, if not every day, then at least every couple of dates. That's just been it is, is the need to put whatever the daydreams are or whatever the kind of fantasies are, especially if I'm listening to music or something like that. And I'll, I'll, imagine the scene that comes out and if i don't get it on the page it just loops and it loops and it loops and it loops until i finally write it down and that's been the way it's always been so when i was a child my best friend and i would write quote unquote plays really they were just long form stories that we forced our parents to sit down and watch <laughs> watch <laughs> us play out and it, it it evolved from there so i i feel like it was it's never really been a choice it's just something that i have to do <laughs> i'm very similar in in that regard, the feeling that the creativity is directly related to your mental state. I get the same way. If I'm not given an opportunity to do some sort of creativity, whether whether it's writing or writing adjacent stuff like world building or or even just thinking um, mm -hmm. uh, or some music or something, if if I'm not given the opportunity to do that, well, pretty damn frequently, uh, <laughs> I get all of the nasty outward directed symptoms of depression you know the irritability the yes. the crankiness the short tempered i mean i guess i'm saying the same thing in three different ways but <laughs> but all of that not necessarily the 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 dip in vitality that depression might bring but it it's just i am not something is off and not to mention that the struggle then of coming back, right? Like you say no no loss of vitality, but like I know for me if I if I go let's say a, a stretch too long without without getting doing something creative, convincing myself or motivating myself then to get back into it after that break is a huge challenge. Oh yeah, that's that's fair. Yeah, and absolutely. Getting back on that horse and because the muscles atrophy, right? I think that, that it it will grow into that for me if 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 it's not addressed. But I wanna I wanna just push a little deeper here. You've told me all about the things, all all the evidence that you have always written that you're driven to write the results if you don't write but have you considered why that is not in depth actually i i just i feel like it's such an inherent part of myself that yeah. I, i've never really given that much thought into the why of it i mean just the emotional joy that it gives me on top of everything else of creating mm -hmm. like spending time with characters that by the end of a book feel as real to me as anyone that i i know in person sure and which is is something that there's one thing nothing that compares to it but there's also no other way to kind of get that other than this job mm -hmm. so it, it's how do you not feel like a god by creating all of these worlds <laughs> and then you know having horrible horrible things happen to them but then in the end sweeping in and fixing all of it <laughs> and that's why i ask because i i had to years ago i had to answer that question for myself because i was asking it of interviewees you know and it, it, it took some digging, you know, uh, I, I realized that while I had never had like an, anything like and not even comparing it to people who actually have to deal with this, but nothing like an abuse of childhood or anything like that. But I realized that my childhood environment was very psychologically unstable. And I figured out I was probably creating and making up these stories and probably importantly, putting them in tangible form, you know, not just daydreaming or playing to impose some level of control. I mean, you said it yourself. How do you come back from being a god? <laughs> and uh, and and not at all saying that that might be similar for you, but that's that's sort of the process that I had to take to to dig around and figure that out. And, and the exercise proved useful if only to, to, to figure out like, okay, well, what about now? You know, why do I create now? And, uh, yeah, I think it, like, as you said, it just, it becomes integral, you know, it's just, it's, it's just part of you. That is now your personality. This is, this is what you do. 
uh, it made you feel better when you were four and five and six. So <laughs> it's, it's going to make you feel good now. But there's, there's absolutely something to that because like it, and it's, you know, when they say like you, you create to work out your demons or anything like that, mm-hmm. but they, it, like you say, it doesn't necessarily even have to be from a trauma. But if I look at how my writing has evolved in terms of my characterizations, in terms of what my conflicts are, mm-hmm. then yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely true because I, I just hearing you talk about it, I'm like it, the, the, Female main characters of my books do tend to not necessarily mirror what I'm going through, but almost in terms of their growth, mirror ways that I am currently working towards mm-hmm. growing. Mm-hmm. So it's like at the moment, let's say I'm I'm working on being better at creating boundaries. But I noticed that all of my main characters are really, really good at setting and, and maintaining those boundaries. <laughs> so it's like it becomes in itself a safe space to kind of explore some of those psychological developments that that I'm trying to work on because even if it goes wrong for them in the most horrible, horrible, gruesome ways, (laughs) that doesn't affect me. That just affects them. And then I can, and then I can dig them out of those holes afterwards and, and they'll be stronger for it, which means that I could probably do the same thing with less gruesome, horrible, bloody results. (laughs) (laughs) Unless that's what you're going for. Um. Unless that's, I mean, you know what? (laughs) Every day is different. (laughs) Well, so yeah, I mean, you've been doing this for a decade. Have have you encountered going back to a story from maybe five or six or eight or ten years ago or a novel and reading it and going, oh, that's that's what I was trying to tell myself. <laughs> like because it it like my first novel, which came out in, in, in 2005, it took a couple of years and it was only kind of going through some minor revisions for a re-release that I was like, oh shit this is so obviously all about daddy issues <laughs> but had i intended that while i was writing it no have you experienced anything like that with your older work occasionally like especially with things like with friendships i think and and the longing that i had to form a really close friends group and then i mm. go back to my first trilogy and like the intense found family that comes from that I'm just mm. like oh like, yeah, like that's, that's something that I was really, really wanting. So I created it. And now I look back and I'm like, oh, well, that's lovely that I <laughs> <laughs> kind of outlined what I want that made it clear for me to actually build what I wanted. So, so definitely kind of like that. Fiction as, as aspiration. Yeah. yeah. And this, this ties kind of into something that, that comes up now and again, when I'm talking to, to writers is now we just talked about you know not realizing that you know what you were trying to tell yourself in a, in a story until till years later but what about in the process um how intentional are you with theme and sort of the underlying meanings of your work while you're creating it not what happens in the story but what the story is about you know what's the real message is or is that something conscious that you're like okay i think i'm going to address this because this is something that that I want to explore for myself or does it come out more organically? I've tried to do that like a bit more consciously. Mm -hmm. So one of the books that I'm working on right now, the series kind of evolved into a bit of a skating commentary on climate change and (laughs) countries and corporations destroying the environment just on the sake of progress. And that kind of took me by surprise because when I first, when I wrote the first book, that was a very, minor part that was kind of in the back of my mind is like a tongue in cheek ha 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 and now that i'm at the third book it's it's a very very big heavy part of the of the story so like that and but i've never really done that before and i feel like i'm enjoying it i'm liking that i have something to say and i'm using my medium of choice and how to say it but most of the time i kind of go for something more organic and i, I feel like the writing it ends up being a bit more natural because of that. Mm -hmm. So often it's something that I won't even kind of clue into what I'm trying to say until let's say the 13th round of revisions where I'm like, Oh, (laughs) this is, this is kind of an ongoing recurring thing that I keep coming back to. I should clean that up and build on it a little bit. Yeah. There was a a novelette that I wanted to write as sort of a, a button on the novel that I'd written before. And so not necessarily like a sequel, but sort of a companion piece like, you know, and then a few days later, here's what happened (laughs) to these folks, you know. (laughs) Um, And 
I knew that it was going to deal with certain things, just be, you know, certain uh, psychological, emotional beats because of what happens in the novelette. But and and you know, I had set myself, okay, well, this will probably take you know maybe six weeks, you know, to, mm. to knock this out. Um, but in the process, and and this is you know talking about you know, not realizing stuff until you know several revisions in. Well, this was an in process kind of thing for me, where it's like, oh yeah, no, this is going to be a lot more difficult <laughs> <laughs> because it is a lot more difficult, uh, you know, to face uh, to because I don't know about you, but it, it, writing for me is is a lot like kind of writing fiction is very much like running a one person play, but you're you know, you're you're in the heads of and playing and feeling everything that the, the that the cast of however many is feeling at any given moment. So it can be exhausting work, you know. Yes. Yeah. And um and yeah, those themes and those deeper meanings, yeah, they didn't start to emerge uh, until maybe a third of the way in and definitely extended the writing process and definitely uh, hopefully made it a deeper, more, more meaningful work overall. So, yeah, absolutely. We don't always know. We, we might have a little vague idea like, oh, I, you know, I think I'd like to t tackle this and, you know, intentionally revealing those issues that might have, you know, just sort of come up otherwise. But, yeah, once you're in it. Oh, oops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, what is it? Feature creep. That mm. is, I, I feel like that kind of can be it. I mean, I know that that's an issue for me, but it, especially when it comes for things like that, it can be an issue where it's just like, okay, I'm going to write this fun little story. And then the next thing you know, it's like this whole shit gets even, real. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And then it's like, there you go. A whole outline for something fun and frivolous is out the window. And all of a sudden it's this <laughs> like hard hitting emotional journey about this thing that has been bothering you. And that you often go on rants about like, <laughs> you know, old man shouting at clouds. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of that, um, because you've you mentioned earlier on that, you know, you've tried to write shorter things and they just grow into longer and longer things, you know, whether entire novels or entire series. Maybe you haven't always been, but are you now more of an outliner planner or do you still just start with a vague idea and, and sort of pants it, as they say? I kind of slingshotted backwards. Mm -hmm. So my 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 very first full novel, I mean, and it, f first published novel that does not include all the ones that will never see the light of day. <laughs> Even Song started as a flash fiction piece that a bunch of people read and said, oh, my God, this would be an amazing book. So I kind of it grew into that, which then grew into a trilogy, which then grew into a nine book saga. Um, so the first book was pretty much pantsed. I feel like the first series, actually, to a, to, a, to an extent, was more or less I came up with it as I went and I love them. Like I've, I've had to reread those three books quite a few times for various reasons. And I still absolutely adore them. Do I see where my writing has evolved and grown and, and all that kind of stuff? Absolutely. But sure. just the, the heart of them, I still love. And then from there, I kind of went into a bit more tent polling. So I kind of worked on that one and then it grew. And then by the time I did what my most recent series, every single step of the way was plotted out. And I loved it because it was like, there was no stress when I went down to write because I knew exactly what I needed to hit on that day. Yeah. And then most of the work then went into strengthening motivations and everything and in, in edits. But then for whatever reason, after that, I, I kind of, I took a huge writing confidence hit after that series, which is silly because I adore that series, but you know, the, the life of the writer, right? So I just kind of, stopped writing for a while part of it was that i had just had my my daughter so there was not a lot of time to sit at my computer to write sure. so i just took out my phone and i was like you know what that was a trial to to do all my edits and work on releasing it so i'm just gonna sit down and i'm gonna write something fun and i pantsed a whole book in in a few weeks mm -hmm. and it was so much fun and it was so interesting because every single time I picked up my phone and I opened that word document, I had no idea where I was going to end up with it. So I'm kind of playing with that now because that, again, it happened. That was supposed to be just a, a fun either novella or a kind of a short serial and has now turned into three different series. <laughs> but I'm pantsing all of them. So oh. I, I, yeah, so I, I'm like, why not? 
I, I can release them whenever I want. I can do as much work during edits as I want, but why not just every time I sit down, write something that excites me. So yeah. like either a heavy emotional scene or a high action scene, it doesn't matter. But every time I sit down, make the next scene in this, just something that makes me excited to read it again. Mm -hmm. And then as, as I notice, as I get closer to like the midpoint of the book or something, the, the rest of it kind of rolls out in a bit of an outline. So I, I, I jot down notes as I come up with them. So by the time I get to the midpoint, I have kind of the second half of it almost loosely outlined, ready to go. But I've been having a lot of fun with the exploratory writing lately. That's very cool. And, and it, it raises a bunch of questions for me. My process tends to be just exploratory writing when it comes to a short story or, or a, a shorter work. And then similarly, you know, you get about maybe to the, to the top of the second act and you start to figure it out, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and kind of know where you have to go. Or for me, a lot of times I'll have the ending first, you know, and so it's a matter of like figuring it all out. But, but for longer works, I'm, I'm a pretty strict outliner down to the beat level. In fact, when I sit down to write, I'm not even thinking about, okay, what's the word count I have to hit today? I, I think, okay, what scene do I need to complete today? Yeah. You know, cause who knows how long it's going to be. It doesn't, you know, if you've got 70 odd scenes, you know, it's going to be a novel. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but your, your method these days, it, it, especially when you're dealing with series and, and multiple trilogy sagas, as you, as you put it, how, how do you handle the continuity, the world building, having, you know, having to avoid retconning something that you'd written and published a year before? <laughs> the answer is we'll find out. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I've only finished the first one. Oh, um, okay. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. So the so the nine book saga was not written in that way. No, the nine book saga is, was was increasingly outlined, and I'm I'm working on the the, the final book of the third trilogy right okay, now. Okay, I got but, you. But um, basically, what I've been doing for this one is I, I I'm I'm a software addict, so mm -hmm. like, and any new books related or story related software, I always try out. But mm -hmm. I, I'm creating a, a story Bible as I go with the ones that I'm pantsing. Mm -hmm. So uh, every time I, I create a new character, I bring them to a new location. I I note that down and I, I feel like already that has come in handy because to add to my challenge to myself, why do I torture myself? I don't know. I think it's probably indicative of, of very deep issues, <laughs> but all the, these three new series that I'm writing, they, they interconnect as well as like they stand independently, but they, they cross over each other at points. Mm -hmm. So apparently I just felt that my, my life wasn't difficult enough and I really needed this challenge. <laughs> so, uh, I, the sort of story Bible so far has been very, very helpful with that because I've been using plotter where you can have multiple timelines showing on your thing. So I can actually see as I go like, okay, so I know that this is there, which means that this series is going to have to start around this point where they can connect at that point. And, it's creating a very pretty colorful picture. I'll say that. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure that there will be a point where I, I've written myself into a corner and I need to figure it out. But it's fortunately, this is where like, it's, this is going to come off, not how I mean it, but it's, it's urban fantasy. So I feel like I'm having a lot more fun with it. Would I do this for one of my epic fantasies? Probably not. And, and for me, the only difference in my mind, and this is just, this is not the way I read it. This is not the way I see the two, two genres because I, I adore them both. But I feel like when it comes to me, when, with the, the, the amount of deeper world building that needs to be in the epic fantasy that I write, I, I feel like I don't know that I would be able to have that kind of process with it. Yeah, yeah. Whereas the urban fantasy I'm working, bonus on bonus, it, I, I'm set here in Ottawa where I am. Mm -hmm. So I can just go for a walk when I like, oh, I need a new location. I'm going to scout it. Oh, here I go. I'm, I'm standing right where I need to where I need to be on that day. So that is adds a whole element of fun. But it also kind of makes a bit of my world building easy because it's I can see it actually. Yeah, yeah for sure. So I've been having I feel like because of, of 
certain of those elements, I have a bit more freedom with this particular series to do that and have fun. And if I write myself into a corner, find creative ways to get myself out of it without too much stress. Again, we'll find out. Ask me in another year if I'm just like, oh yeah, no, I, I, I yeah, no idea. I had to, <laughs> I had to blow up the world and do a time travel thing to go back to. <laughs> it was just a dream. It was just a dream. <laughs> So that's interesting about uh, the the story Bible. I I also am always I'm constantly looking for the dream tool, right? The one thing that <laughs> can work from start to finish. It's interesting you're you're using Plotter for your story Bible. I wouldn't have thought of that. I've played around with that a little bit, and in my persnickety nature, it's like no, no, this is this is too constraining. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, what are some of the other tools that you use in terms of software for, for the creative process? At the moment, my two are actually Scrivener, but I use it pretty much exclusively as a, as a word processor. Mm -hmm. I, I like the kind of cleanliness of it just for that purpose. Mm -hmm. I looked at Atticus and I, I had for formatting because I use a PC. I'm not, I, I don't have yeah, a Mac, here. so I don't have Vellum. So I was looking for something that would help me with the formatting, but I felt like it was trying to do too much right out the go and everything not none of it jived with what i needed or what i wanted yeah it's not ready for prime time it's yeah yeah, yeah. so i tried novel factory for a while which was kind of also fun but it too i don't know i, I got lost in it mm -hmm. i've looked at a few others but i at the moment i'm trying to limit myself to scrivener and plotter and and i haven't tried getting them to talk yet apparently they they do now like quite mm. easily i haven't tried it yet but i mm. want to give eventually at some point but yeah and then of course obviously word and then in design for my for my formatting mm -hmm. i don't know if, if if you since you don't outline a whole lot but i don't know if you use any like note-taking things or anything like that i practically live in this uh very basic text and markdown outliner called dynalist Ooh, um, yeah, I'm, gonna have, I'm writing that down right now because again, <laughs> I, I'm always looking for new things. <laughs> the thing about it is it is just, I mean, it looks, it's just a bulleted list, right? On, on the surface, but every one of them is infinitely nestable. Every one of those bullet points can be its own single focus document. It's completely searchable. It allows for internal linking you know cross linking oh and there's if, if you're a pc person i'm imagining you're also an android person there's a web app and uh you know you can share to like 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 if, you, if you're like me i read a bunch of blogs in the morning with my coffee and you can basically bookmark those into a special page of your dyna list so bang there's your commonplace book that sounds incredibly sexy <laughs> it, it is it's great i use it for my my daily calendar and my brain dump and everything else and it's so simple and it cross syncs pretty much instantaneously to all your devices so <laughs> i'll write a grocery list on my computer and then there it is on my phone when i get to the grocery store you know but it's it's not i mean i did write a nonfiction book in it but yeah, for, for fiction, I mean, I, I go back and forth to creating mind maps, to doing, yeah. you know, whiteboards. Well, that's a fun one also that I, I, I've kind of fallen off of it, but it's, uh, it's Scapple, which yeah. is the same people as Scrivener. Mm -hmm. I, I tried that for a while. It wasn't, uh, it's export function seems really yes. buggy. So I found something called uh, Mindomo or Mindomo. Uh, which is not free, uh, but it's both web-based and PC-based, um, which is also, that's, a, that's the other big thing for me. It's got to be something that I can use offline just yeah. in case, you know? Absolutely. Um, and something that I can save the, the, the files locally or to a Dropbox or something like that so that whatever I'm working on, I can work on it, you know? Um, but it's uh, it does export pretty well to various formats, and it's got an outline view. You can change it, you know, from the mind map to the outline. And um, yeah, I'm using that pretty heavily in my current work on work in progress because that ended up being way more complicated, both thematically and character emotionally <laughs> and and actual plot wise than I had anticipated. Kudos to you for keeping it down to like two tools, more or less. <laughs> I wish I could. I want, I want it. 
I tried Notion, which kind of sounds like it's a similar thing to the Dynalist, and I found it way too clunky. Yes. Total lie, because I also have another one that I use for kind of to help. Right now, I'm juggling seven projects. Two are in edits, five are in draft, wow. which is, is more than I've ever tackled before. Um, it's part of my apparently 2023 goal of driving myself absolutely batty. Um, so I've tr- been trying Hive. Now, not the one that's a social media Twitter replacement. It's a, it's a different one, but it's like great for, for team management. I'm my only team member, but that's okay. But I can have things in like Gantt view and calendar view. And so that's been helping me kind of, okay, so if this is my release date, this is when I need to finish my, my first draft, second draft, like all of my edits so I can break it down so that I can see every day when I come in. Mm-hmm. Um, because right now, um, my husband and I are both self-employed. So we split our day with our work time versus who's watching our daughter. So when I come into work, I need to basically get to work. I'm, I'm a huge bullet journaler as well, because I like that tangible tactile. Oh, yeah. yeah I, used to do, I used to do that. Yep. So <laughs> give me the highlighters and the colorful <laughs> pens. <laughs> and so I feel like Hive is kind of like that, but it, it a bit more just because it's digital freedom to to go forward with that so i I really like that one it helps keep me on track because one of the biggest questions that i'm asked is you know you write so much you get so much done how do you have the discipline for it and it's like part of it is just i'm a totally self-controlled and and by that i don't mean i have good self-control i mean i'm always in competition with myself to have better self-control than i did yesterday you know yourself (laughs) well enough to to know how to achieve or at least uh, approach that self-control yeah and that you need it yeah yeah, exactly i get get it i get it (laughs) so the three pillars of the show right are making stuff finding success as we each define it and and staying healthy and sane in the process. And we're sort of edging into that, that defining and finding success portion. How do you define success for yourself as, as a creator, as a writer, and how's it going and what are you doing to get there? I'm not there yet, but I feel like, well, I mean, like everything, it's like a waves, ebbs and flows. You get closer, you get pearled a bit further away, but I don't have like lofty ambitions. I don't need to be the next billionaire author or anything like that, but at least having enough to support my family and my daughter's future and being able to go out and buy books without gift certificates whenever I want to without stressing about, is it that, or is it going to be whether I buy this overpriced thing of milk? Not because it's special milk, just because the price of milk is so Mm -hmm. ridiculous right now. (laughs) (laughs) So that, that for me is kind of, it's kind of it. And I feel like I've gotten really close a few times over the years, but because this is an industry that changes so often and so quickly you get there and then you kind of flow back. And I refuse to get too defeated over that because that's just part of learning. Like that, yeah. that's my, my mentality on it is okay. So that didn't work. So now I do another review of what kind of seems to be working, give it a shot in my own way and see if that gets me any closer. It did great. Let's build on that and see if it gets me any closer. And so that's kind of it is, is, I would love for my writing to let me sit comfortably in a lifestyle that makes me happy. That's kind of the image when I do my vision boards. It's not big mansions. It's things like, cool, we can go on family vacation this year or something. Right. You've almost perfectly described my own sort of uh, sort of goal in that regard. It's like, I don't need much, but I don't want to have to think about when I need or want, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I don't, you know, uh, that's it just to, to, and and what does that mean? You know, maybe that's $80,000 a year. Maybe it's a hundred thousand dollars a year. Who knows? You mentioned, you know, how everything is constantly changing. I try to approach everything constantly feeling like basically at best an experienced beginner every single day. Yeah. Um, you know, that sort of beginner's mind, uh, to quote the Buddhists is, you have to, especially in, and, and, and you're, are you exclusively self-published or hybrid yeah. or yeah. So especially in self-publishing, you know, because uh, as you mentioned, every, every, everything is constantly changing and something that worked two months ago exactly. <laughs> doesn't work anymore. <laughs> and, and you mentioned you're self-employed. So your day job is not the writing. There's another thing. Uh, it's mostly the writing, it's, oh. but I also have a, a side kind of hustle as a, I do some proofreading contracts. Oh, yeah. So like that, that absolutely helps. Right. Uh, and, uh, but yes, it's, we've just been 
been lucky enough that I can kind of throw myself into it. And it also helps because my husband's also self-employed. He's a, an artist. So he, we're both, we're two creatives in the house. So, oh my gosh, it's amazing that it, that the whole place isn't falling apart. <laughs> But I've been very, very, very grateful and very lucky to be given the opportunity to, to pursue this full time. And then I kind of go back and forth like every once in a while to be like, oh, coffers are a little bit low. So I'll go when I get myself a, a contract or a day job for a few months or something. And we call mm-hmm. them si- side quests. <laughs> <laughs> and then as soon as it's feasible and responsible to do it back, I go to this. So I've been I've been more or less full time since I think 2018. Wow, that's fantastic. That's uh, that's kind of great that you're both focused vocationally and and aspirationally on creative stuff because sure yeah like you said it's a wonder everything hasn't just fallen apart but at least you you know have similar mindsets and similar approaches and and uh, I talk to people all the time where it's like I I cannot uh, communicate how important it is for me to just be left alone. (laughs) (laughs) And, and you guys have divided up the child time, you know, childcare time and all that. And it sounds like, uh, it sounds like a good balance. How, uh, how difficult was it to sort of find that balance with your husband, with your partner? Just like everything else has been evolving. We we moved in together, I think actually 2018, because we moved in together shortly after I went full time, because he's Mm -hmm. the one that, that encouraged me to take that leap and do that. Mm. And so he he still had a day job at that point. So I wrote as soon as he left. And oh, my gosh, if ever he had to come home early, I was in a foul mood all day because my schedule got thrown off. And then he had to deal with that. I love you. What are you doing here? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's <laughs> fine that you're home, but get out of my office. <laughs> and then when we moved, his office was in the basement. Mine was upstairs. So it was great. We would just separate in the morning and leave each other alone until the end of the day. And then now he built me this amazing office outside of the house. So it's like, it's in the backyard in like what was kind of a storage shed that he just completely stripped down, drywalled, insulated. And so now I actually get to leave the house to go to work, which is- I'm a little jealous. (laughs) Oh, this is like a dream come true for me. (laughs) And so like the the distance is a huge factor of it because then the the desire to just kind of walk in and see what the other person is up to is kind of less. And then obviously my daughter came in, my daughter look at me being all possessive our (laughs) daughter (laughs) and changed everything again Mm -hmm. and for the first three months of her life she would not be away from me at all so i didn't get any time unless he put up with her screaming but slowly so at first i would get a half hour in the morning to come out and be by myself. And so that was uh, like, uh, she was about six months old at that point. And then we worked it up to an hour, an hour and a half. And now we have it split that we both get four hours a day. So it's constantly evolving. We're not sure what we're going to do when her naps go away. Mm. That, that'll change everything all over again. But like everything else, it's constant communication. Like, okay, I'm on deadline this week. Okay, what what do you need extra that I can do to support you? And I do the same with him. So it's like, okay, you need to get this sculpt done. So I can take her for this extra hour. And it's just just like every again, everything in this industry, everything in this in this in the creative line of career is constantly changing. So I think it's been very, very good practice for the rest of our marriage to have just just that constant open communication of what are your needs? How can we change things up so that they're met? That's great. Yeah. And that, that kind of, that's a crossover with the healthy, insane portion of, of, of our show, which is, which is totally fine. And, and, but no, I, I think that's wonderful. And, but to, to circle a little bit back to speaking of how, you know, in, in the self-publishing industry uh, sphere, such as it is, and in as much as it is not a monolithic thing, you know, rules for one genre, even as they change completely different from another, but what are some of the things that you found consistently work for you uh, in terms of getting your stuff into the hands of the people who would most enjoy reading it? The one consistent thing that has not changed across the years is is um, newsletter promos. So things like, obviously, the, the book Bob featured ad being the biggest one, but uh, ENT, all of those, like th- those to me always have had the best launching point consistently. And then I've been playing a lot with ads as well. But I hate marketing, like most people, right? Like that, that's not that's not new, that's not unique. <laughs> um, so but it's so my my goal has been to find ways that I enjoy 
So it's like, okay, well, if that's a big thing, that's really popular, that's fine. But if I'm not clicking with it, I'm not going to do it because mm-hmm. if I don't have fun with it, it's not going to work. Yeah. It so, becomes insincere and, and, exactly. and, that, and that shows. Yeah. And so I've been having, like, I have finally dipped my toe into reels this year, but only if, if I have the idea and only if I find it fun. So I, I've really been tr- trying to kind of approach it from a connectivity point. Mm-hmm. And because of that, I've kind of been enjoying it more. Like my, my favorite, my absolute go-to is in person. Yeah. I am such an introvert. Like I, I, COVID has been great for me in the sense of it has been my excuse to stay home and not see anyone. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I know Preach. that yeah, like I know a lot of people struggle with that and like because it's been very, very hard. But for me, it's it's been almost an opportunity to take a deep breath to be mm-hmm. like, huh, now I don't need to fake excuses not to see people. <laughs> and but that being said, like as much as I am ultra hermit you put me behind a table where i where i'm selling my books and mm. i can do three days of, of eight hours nine hour ten hour days and not feel it at all i love it I, and my favorite part is not yes yeah, cool selling the books is fantastic but it's never my goal going in it's who can i meet today mm-hmm. who can who can i talk to about this thing that i love which is creating these worlds creating these characters reading in general so I'm, I'm still kind of trying to f- find a way to take what I'm really passionate about behind that table and bring it to an online sphere. Mm-hmm. And I haven't quite landed it yet. I, I want to look at maybe doing some more live videos or anything like that, where it's just like, okay, so if, if face-to-face is my thing, how do I do that? Yeah. <laughs> and trying to find ways to market myself that give me that same rush of, I love doing this. I love this part of this job. And as much as like the newsletter promos are fantastic for getting my books in readers' hands, they're not a guarantee that they'll buy the next book. Whereas connecting with readers and getting them to buy the book and then staying connected with them either through my newsletters or anything like that, that's far more rewarding. And it's a slower build, but I feel like it has the potential of having a longer reach. That's uh, we're very simpatico in a lot of uh, our approaches and ideas. I uh, the nonfiction book I put out last year was uh, indie author infrastructure, and it was all about that, all about building the things you need to have in place to build a reader community, not to sell books, not to to hit the bestseller charts, not in none of that, but but to build a long term reader community uh, the folks who are fans of you not yeah. fans of a particular book or a particular series folks who will will follow you from your epic fantasy to your urban fantasy to whatever else you might do you know the newsletter thing so uh, social media you know doing things like reels and stuff like that we all know that that's that's great for some exposure that's great you know you might uh bring in a few people here and there and you know maybe you disagree but the the email newsletter seems to be the only thing that really has consistent consistent results is that what you found it is so it's not something i i completely agree with you um but it's not something that i have put my focus in on in the last couple of years for for a whole slew of reasons but i have noticed that since i fell off trying to build my newsletter i have noticed the effect of it mm. And so, again, one of my goals for this year is to kind of get back on it because absolutely it has that it has that kind of direct communication thing that social media doesn't yeah. often. Often I use social media less to connect with readers and more to connect with other authors. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I find that that takes a lot of the pressure off of it, too, if I'm looking at it as more of a networking tool than mm-hmm. a, a sales tool. Yeah. It's same thing with the newsletter. I don't see it as a sales tool per se, but I, I definitely see it as a way to connect with that one with readers. Like these are people who want to hear from me. So mm-hmm. that gives me the freedom to actually communicate with them. So like that, that's definitely a goal for me for this year is to build that up. I was hit when, because of life, when the, I always get the order of the letters mixed up. The GRPD oh, yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> um, came in and they're like, you need to, cut anyone who doesn't reply to your emails. And it was like this huge confidence hit that I haven't been able to get back since then. So that was kind of the point of like, oh, fine, I'm just giving up with this nonsense and kind of creeping back up slowly after that. But 
part of it is like, there's only so many reader magnets that I'm able to come up with when I'm trying to focus on getting, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> getting the actual books out. So that's kind of slowed it down as well. And then I'm also kind of playing a bit with Patreon right now as well. So kind of trying a whole bunch of different things, but I, I completely agree. The newsletter to me is like, it's a big, it's a hugely important factor. So when you do like a book bub, which isn't exactly a newsletter swap kind of situation, but more of a just being advertised in their newsletter, mm-hmm. have you played with any, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I think it's, I think it's book funnel that does the newsletter swap kind of thing. And how much of that do you find translate to people actually getting on and staying on your own yeah. mailing list. I, I've used a few of them and then I need to go and, and I stopped getting uh, recommendations from them though, which was kind of like, man, that was making my life so easy. I didn't need to do any work myself. I was just getting me, hey, check out these lists. Um, so I, I need to go and actually make a concerted effort to look into them. But I, I was getting good luck adding people on. The people staying on, that is a trickier one. Mm-hmm. So like, I love... Newsletter Ninja was a, is a fantastic kind of book resource on how to create your funnels and things like that. So I, I get a lot of engagement to start. My open rate is, is pretty good, mm-hmm. but I feel like the, the trickle off is pretty high, which could just be a reflection on, on what I'm sending out isn't what people are looking for. But, you know, it's it's like everything you just keep. There's a lot of spaghetti on my wall. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I hear that. Yeah, I hear that. Oh, and I wanted to mention, because um, you talked about the uh, needing to to cull your mailing list. So that's actually a good thing. I don't it know. If you, I, okay. I didn't know if you, you've heard this advice before, but yeah, you, you, I do this every six months where I, I look at the folks who haven't opened anything and, uh, you know, I send them three emails over the course of 10 days you know, uh, if you want to stay on, click this link. Oh, by the way, just in case you missed it, if you want to stay on, click this link. And then the last one is, if I don't hear from you, it, uh, you know, no harm, no foul. Uh, <laughs> but if you ever want to resubscribe, here's how to do it. Bye bye. Uh, and that, Oh, absolutely. Uh, Keeping yeah. the list healthy will increase all of your stats. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, and not just that, it's the, the, the people who go away aren't, and I, I say this without without it being as cruel or heartless as it sounds, <laughs> but those aren't the people that matter. Yeah. No, absolutely. You want the people who actually, re- who, who reply to when, when you ask a question yeah, and, yeah. and, and pick up the books that you recommend that you get, because you're like, Oh man, I read this book and I absolutely loved it. Have you read it? Or are you going to read it? And they're like, Oh wow. Thank you for recommending it. I'm like, bam, I like you. Right. Right. <laughs> Yeah. And, and the spaghetti on the wall thing, I, I totally get that. This, this really should be the year, or honestly, this should be the quarter that I clean up and fix all of my funnels because I I know how to do all that stuff, but, (laughs) but over the, over the years, and I think maybe you've experienced this too, is if you've been collecting this data, collecting these connections, the ends start to fray a little bit. If I open ConvertKit, my mailing list software, and, and I look at the the funnels that are going up, it's like, oh, and all the tags and all the segments, it's like, oh, geez, <laughs> this, it, this, this, my, my wall is papered in spaghetti. It's not just. <laughs> <laughs> Forget wallpaper. It's a whole new trend. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, the house is made of spaghetti and, uh, <laughs> and, and too many of the strands don't actually connect. Yeah. But it's, but no, I think you've got the right idea it is making those direct connections. Yeah. You know, you're not constantly trying to convince them. They already right. know. So yeah. you, you can, you can trip and fumble as much as you want. And they're just going to go, Oh, you, instead of, you know, being put <laughs> off by it. And yeah. then, and again, it creates a more fun environment, which then in turn makes it an easier environment, which, you know, again, so much of this job is hard <laughs> <laughs> that any opportunity you can have to make it enjoyable or decrease the chat, like the constant uphill challenge of everything is just oh my gosh it it makes such a change coming into work every day yeah yeah and and building those those uh whether it's one to many well really what it is it's one to many and one to one at the same time you know yes. uh, yeah. and i there's a uh, a musician mike watt considered sort of a grandfather figure these days in in the independent music, punk rock music, but he plays all kinds of different genres. He's a bass player. But many, many years ago in a documentary, he was, uh, he said something that I've quoted forever. And he was talking about the relationship between 
not just fellow creators, but between creators and the audience. And he, and he tends to talk in, in he's kind of a walking colloquialism machine. <laughs> uh, but what he said was, you know, if you look up to somebody, you look down on somebody, you're going to get a crick in your neck. <laughs> if you look straight across your shoulder, eye to eye, no crick. Yes. <laughs> and what he that was basically is. saying is we're all peers uh, and and authors and readers are peers. Uh, we need them. And, uh, you know, I think I think it's not art and, until you know, my podcast listeners are going to get sick of me of hearing me say this, but it's not art until someone other than the person who made the thing experiences it. Yeah. They especially with with fiction, you know, I'm sure you've experienced this over and over again, where a reader will be like, oh, I so loved how you blah, 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 blah in your book. And they're like, wait, I did what? <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. That circles back to, you know, the unintentional themes and stuff that, that we talked about earlier. They close the circuit. Well, it's it's as soon as it's out in the world, it's no longer yours anymore. And so any interpretation they have is 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 entirely on them. And it's people's favorite characters fascinate me <laughs> because like or their favorite lines, because I'll come in with my my own biases by the time I finish a book. Yeah. And so to hear the reader response to it of being like, oh, I love this wee super minor character that you mentioned once on that page. And I'm just like, wow, I completely forgot I wrote that scene. Good. I'm glad you liked it. Like, oh, you should get a whole new series. I'm like, please don't tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's segue a little bit into, and, and and we've kind of, as all these things overlap, we've kind of talked about some of this stuff, the drive to create and what happens when we don't, the the balance that you've kind of struck with your home life and, and, and creating. But, uh, you know, the third pillar of the show is staying healthy and sane in the process, either elaborating on what you've already talked about or or adding some new things to this. What are some of your practices? What what works for you in in making sure you're serving the genius inside, you know, uh, in the traditional meaning of the word, uh, the original meaning of the word and keeping up with everything else, just living a healthy, sane life while you're trying to build a creative life? What's been working? What doesn't work? What doesn't work? Trying to control <laughs> everything. My my therapist keeps telling me that one day I'll I'll listen to her and stop trying it. You know, talk about pillars. I feel like I'm such a compartmentalizer, which is where the bullet mm. journaling comes in. Mm -hmm. And to a point, I need to learn how to relax more and be a bit more flexible. But I've broken my life down into these kind of categories. And as long as at some point throughout the day, I'm, I maintain those categories to a point, the sanity tends to be somewhat stable. I'm not saying that it's fully in place, but I'm pretty sure I lost that ages ago. <sighs> my husband and I were huge walkers. Fortunately, we have a dog, which means that on days like today, when we have 20 centimeters of snow that we're trudging through, we have, we have someone that pushes us out the door to do it. But the, just physical movement is a huge key thing for me. So like, I love, I used to love going for solo walks, like music in ears and just going because mm -hmm. that was a great time, not only to like physically get moving, but also to let the mind wander. Um, so which is why actually right now I love shoveling because it kind of gives me that chance to just be in my own head for a little bit. Yeah. Also on that, we, we do kitchen dance parties a lot. So finding ways to, to move is both healthy, but mentally as well as, as physically reading time. Oh my gosh, is so key. I had stopped for a while and I don't know if the lack of reading caused the depression or if the depression caused the lack of reading, mm -hmm. but the two were definitely uh, hand in hand. And so I noticed as soon as I take a half hour of reading time a day, minimum, usually it's more, uh, I can, I can stay relatively at an even keel, but that reading time is so, so crucial. And not only because it inspires more writing ideas, but just that time with other people's characters and more importantly, other people's <laughs> problems that put mine into perspective. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and then the, the, the other key thing is just again, that for me is that bullet journal. My daughter's just getting into coloring in all of my books. So we're trying to teach her good books to color in versus bad books to color in. <laughs> and and um, before she was, she was coloring in my agenda from last year that I didn't, I wasn't using all that much. I'm like, okay, that's fine. She goes for this one. I'm like, no, honey, this is mommy's life. <laughs> so <laughs> she, she has a page in it that I let her color in, but it's, it's every morning I do a brain dump in there. 
Mm-hmm. And I find that sets me up for the whole day. It's just like, okay, this is this is everything that I need to accomplish. These are my top three priorities. These are the top three things that I would like to do. But if I don't, then that's fine. And these are just kind of the things that I need to get done at some point that somehow magically keep getting bumped week after week, like folding laundry. I think that's a thing that people do. Uh, not in this house. <laughs> I mean, you're just going to wear the stuff. So eh. exactly. We have the hampers there. We can dig out of them when we need something new. Yep. So I think, yeah, like that is, is that constant rearranging of priorities. So it's just like every day I know that going for a walk is a priority. Otherwise I get headaches and I feel gross. And why would I do that to myself? Even Mm. if it's cold and it's snowy and I don't want to go, I know I'll be happier if I do, but tomorrow the priority may be different. And so for me, that bullet journal is just so key because it helps me see that first thing in the morning of what are my priorities today? And if I can hit those and the rest of the day is just kind of gravy. How good are you at actually gauging? (laughs) Like, okay, these are the things on the must do today list. How often do those end up on the, oh, I guess I'm doing that tomorrow. Do you know yourself well enough for you, barring the unforeseen, of course, yeah. uh, how good are you? Cause I'm terrible at this. Uh, how good are you <laughs> at, uh, uh, at stopping the things, you know, okay. I, I'm not going to put more than X number of things on that must do today because I know, you know, have you, have you figured that out? <laughs> I sort of have, like, if it's on the list, I get it done. I have this thing about to do lists that if it's there, and it's doable, then I'll get it done because then you get that satisfying check. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm also, I, especially now, I wasn't always this good, but I do, I also try to kind of be reasonable of, okay, I need to write this down because if I don't write it down, I'm going to forget that I need to do it, mm-hmm. but it doesn't need to be done this morning. Right. So, so I feel like the fact that because we have the assigned hours, I have two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon to get my work done. So it's like, okay, so the morning I know is when I'm better at my uh, administrative tasks. So bam, 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 get those done. If I still have time, I can do those. The afternoon is my writing time. So it's like, okay, these are the projects I need to work on today. This is how I'm going to divvy up my time to do it. And because I'm quite selfish with my office time, so because I have that time, I find it easier to just be like, okay, this is how I need to block up my day to make sure that I'm able to get everything done. And there are some days where like an administrative task will take longer than I expect because technology and sure. I, and I won't get something else done or, or a scene that I need to edit will take longer than I expect. So if something else gets bumped, it happens, but I would say five days out of seven, I'm, I'm pretty good at, at, getting, at knocking those three priorities off and usually including a few of those secondary priorities as well. But again, it kind of comes down to the I'm super hyper competitive with myself, probably to an unhealthy extent, but there you have it. <laughs> and so it's it's the I need to get it done because otherwise I am letting past me win. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like I found that with word counts. Yesterday I did 2000. So today I need to hit 2,500. Well, then tomorrow's me is going to be like, oh, well, you better hit 3000 then otherwise. And then before I know it, I'm like pushing 5,500 words a day and then bam, that's insta burnout. So I was going to say, yeah, is is there a sort of a a, a foreman in your head who's like, okay, we're approaching the diminishing returns point. Cool your jets. (laughs) And that voice has gotten louder in Mm. recent years, which I am very grateful for because it, it was, it was getting pretty bad there for a while. It sounds like the key for you is structure and, and, and sticking with it. And granted, it also sounds like a lot of that structure kind of fell into place uh, when you had your daughter um, by necessity. Uh, How were you before you had that, little person dictating how the world was going to go <laughs> even worse <laughs> like yeah. um if you open up dictionary workaholic mm. you're going to find my name in it okay i was not good at, at paring down my priorities to three per day it was like no it has to be like 15 per day like i, I you know i've got a whole eight hours in my day heck nine ten twelve i would i would work 12 hour days easily because sure. one i love my job but also there's a lot to do a lot of hats mm-hmm. um so the big, big, big thing that has changed, and I feel much for the better, not only for my mental health, but also for the probably the quality of the work, is forcing myself to limit that structure. 
It's like, okay, so I have four hours a day instead of 12, which means I need to be more careful about what I do with it. But also I need to go back into the house after this and have enough energy left over for a two-year-old. I can't push myself to the brink anymore. I have to be reasonable and responsible (laughs) with how how much work I do and how much of myself I throw into this. And again, I feel like the the reflection on that is, is a, increase in quality like a a slight decrease in 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 production but an increase in quality in what i do with that time because i have less time to do it in so i it's it's been very 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 positive work smart not more in other words exactly and and something that i never really understood before until until i had kind of that that external push to to do it so if you could take everything that that you have learned and discovered in building a creative writing life over the last for you decade or so or longer, and if you could distill it all down, is there one sort of almost but not quite bumper sticker <laughs> maxim or that you could always look to that's sort of the the one thing that that will always work that always that you can always come back to when it comes to your creative writing life i think to do that i need to quote from parks and rec because from the the finale there's a a line that leslie says that has stuck out that i want up on my wall and it's find your team and get to work and i feel like that is so key because it's not just your family that's supporting you, but it's also your fellow authors. It's also your readers. It's Mm -hmm. also your cover artists, your editors. And I've worked with ones that I did not click with at all. And the results were atrocious. And there are ones that I fell in love with working with because they pumped me up and they motivated me and inspired me. And they make even the hard days worth coming back to, because you know that even when you're falling on your butt and you don't think you can pull yourself back up again, there's your team that's there to be like, Oh, well, no, like you have this next book to do. And I love it. I've read it. It's fantastic. Or like it, you know, just anything like the support and, and finding the right people to work with. You can't do this in a vacuum. As much as as much as it's a solitary job, you cannot do it in a vacuum and expect to be able to keep your output up or your quality up or your mental health up. You need the support and you need the people and you need to find that team. That quotation right there, that is my bumper sticker. <laughs> That's pretty great. And this conversation has been great. I think that uh, the Sonatotum listeners are going to get a lot out of it. Krista Walsh, thank you so much for being on Sonatotum. And thank you very much for having me. Hey there. If you've enjoyed this or any other episode of Sonatotum, here are three things you can do to help support the show. The first thing, if you haven't already, please subscribe for free to Sonatotum with Matthew Wayne Selznick wherever you get your podcasts. Whichever app or platform you use, find that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Second thing, please just take a moment to rate and review Sonatotum, again, wherever you get your podcasts. Rating is quick and easy. Five stars is very nice. Go ahead and give the show whatever you think the show deserves. If you have just a few minutes more, please let the world know why you enjoy the show why other people should listen to it and subscribe by writing a brief review in your own words. Subscribing, rating, and reviewing, that all costs you nothing but time, but they make a big difference for the show because when people are looking for podcasts on the writing and creative life, Sonatotum is more likely to show up in search results if it has a high rating and some nice reviews. Finally, Sonatotum with Matthew Wayne Selznick is made available for free and has no advertising. But it does cost time, resources, and money to produce every single week. If you'd like to go the extra mile and you have the will and the means, I hope you'll consider becoming a patron to offset the cost associated with the show and my other creative endeavors. Not only will you be a member of the Multiversalists community of writers, readers, and creators, you'll receive special access, perks, and exclusive content, the least of which is the uncut, unproduced edition of every episode of Sonatotum. 
Also, get this, your first seven days are free. After that free trial, it's just $5 per month. Visit mattselznick.com slash b-a-patron to find out more and to start your free trial. That's it. If you do one or two or all three of those things, you'll really be helping the show. And more people like you will discover the Sonatota mission of helping writers and other creators make stuff, find success, and stay healthy and sane in the process. Thank you. There it is, my friends, my conversation with the author Krista Walsh, who once again, you can find at Krista with a K, K-R-I-S-T-A, Krista Walsh Author dot com. And, you know, I'm going to want to hear what you thought about all of that. As always, you can leave a comment in the show notes right there at Matt selznick.com slash sonatotum dash zero eight six because this is episode 86 of sonatotum oh and by the way it's uh tuesday night may 30th 2023 as i record this little intro and outro portion of this episode for you coming at you from the uh lush and lavish studios of MWS Media, as I do so often. Leave a comment right there in the show notes, mattselznick.com slash sonatotum dash 086. Or you can simply email me at matt at mattselznick.com. Or you can record a little voice message on your phone and email that to me at matt at mattselznick.com. Dot com. That's M-A-T-T-S-E-L-Z-N-I-C-K dot com. Hey, you know, I wouldn't be anywhere without the gracious help of my member patrons, my multiversalists. You heard all about the multiversalists member community in the interstitial announcement right after the interview a few minutes back. So I would love to thank, and I will thank, and I am thanking my patrons Chuck Anderson, Amy Bowen, J.C. Hutchins, and Ted Leonhardt. It's just $5 a month to become a multiversalist patron, and you will receive, among other things, the uncut, unedited editions of every episode of this podcast. And when it comes to the interview shows... That's usually about a half hour of extra content. There's a whole bunch of stuff that Krista and I got into that didn't make the final cut due to the fact that I like to keep these public versions of the show around an hour. So think about that. Become a multiversalist at mattselznick.com slash B dash A dash patron. All right, my friends. Next episode, episode 87, it'll just be me talking to you about whatever I've been doing creatively, whatever I've learned, whatever I think might be of interest and use to you in your own creative writing life. That'll be in about a week. My name is Matthew Wayne Selznick. Take care. <laughs>